Welcome back to the Anxiety Slayer podcast. I'm Shan Vanderleek, and today I'm sharing a conversation with clinical psychologist and lecturer and podcaster, Glenn Tanner. This episode of Anxiety Slayer is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. If you've been considering seeing a therapist, but you're not sure where to start, BetterHelp will assess your counseling needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist so you can start getting the support you need online in under 24 hours. Anxiety Slayer listeners can get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. That's betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Glenn Tanner. Glenn is a clinical psychologist from Sydney, Australia, who is also the host of the MindCog podcast, where he interviews experts in the fields of psychology, neuroscience, well-being, high performance, and many other fields. And his intention here is to break down the science behind your mind, brain, and behavior. Welcome to Anxiety Slayer, Glenn. Hi, Shan. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure. And, and thanks for listening to Anxiety Slayer because that's how you found us and reached out to set up this interview. And grateful that we're finally here having a conversation. Indeed. I'm a huge fan. Let's begin with your story. You share that you've suffered with anxiety your entire life. And I'd love for you to share with our listeners when you realize this and how dealing with anxiety has informed and led to the, the man you are today. As long as, I, as far back as I can remember, I've had anxiety. I was just thinking about this the other day. A client of mine said the exact same thing. And, and I, I asked the client, I said, look, can, can you cast your memory back to when you first, when, when you first had that experience with anxiety? And uh, she said when I was three and she could pinpoint the exact moment. And for me, it was around about four years old. I remember just being very aware of my feelings, very aware of my emotions, just being hypersensitive to threat. And I guess I had it in my family. My mum had severe anxiety. She also had schizophrenia as well. And my father had, had social anxiety as well. And we grew up in a, in a poorish neighborhood. It wasn't the best. It certainly wasn't the worst. They get a lot, they do get a lot worse. But it, but it wasn't very good. And there wasn't a lot of that, that nurturing. There wasn't a, love, a lot of that love in those early days. And, and I guess it just sort of created, it was just a perfect environment to create an anxious young child. Moving through, through my teens and, and into, in, uh, into high school, uh, like a lot of you know, teenagers, I was, I was anxious. I was very socially awkward. So that, that didn't really help. I was a, a tall, gangly looking guy with no confidence and uh, a whole heap of acne on my face. So I didn't really do too well with the girls. That's, a, that's another story. And moving through uh, my years in my 20s and now even into my, into my 30s, I still experience anxiety. But I guess it was really at its peak in my, in my 20s and 30s. And that's a result of some unfortunate relationships I had. I was in a rather abusive relationship for about seven years, which wasn't a very good environment for the, for the anxiety, which sort of got out of control and spiraled. And yeah, that's sort of when I, I thought, well, look, it's time to do something about this. It's time to go and see someone because I don't want to be like this for the rest of my life. And around about the age of, I think it was 27, I started seeing a psychologist. I got right into a lot of self-help books and started doing all those things to turn my life around. And one of those things was enroll in a psychology degree. And here I am. Well, thank you for sharing. I can relate to identifying when anxiety, or in my case, I label it responsibility, showed up in my life I'm far too young. Hearing a little bit about your story, I, I can relate. You used to be a winemaker. How does Glenn the winemaker become Glenn, the psychologist. Initially, when I was in high school, I wanted to be either a, a lawyer or a psychologist. I wasn't sure uh, which one I was going to be, but I knew it was going to be one of the two. But I suffered from really, really bad self-esteem. Um, I had a my dad was really quite abusive. He would put me down a lot, so I, I just didn't have the belief that I could succeed 
at going to university, getting through the degree, becoming a lawyer uh, or a psychologist. And um, I just wound up in the wine industry. You know, I had a friend who was working in the wine industry. I lived in Newcastle, which is about two hours north of Sydney for those people listening in the States. And Newcastle is about 35 minutes away from a, a really beautiful wine region called the Hunter Valley. It's not quite like Napa Valley. It's, uh, it's about half the size of the Napa Valley. Well, probably a quarter of the size of Napa Valley. Anyway, so I started working there and fell in love with it. And, um, you know, I, I enjoyed working as a winemaker. The days were long. We'd uh, get up very early. We'd start sampling um, the wine quite early as well. So it made for really long days. We had a lot of friends. It was a wonderful lifestyle. We were pampered, um, always drinking fine wine, eating great food, but there was something missing. And, uh, I was coming home at the end of the day and I just didn't feel satisfied within myself. I knew that there was something missing. I had a, a bigger calling, so mm. to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and this kept happening, uh, for, about a year. And then towards, I think I was about 27, 28. Um, and I was seeing a therapist as well. And it, it just really amplified. And I would come home at the end of a long day and I would just have this little voice in my head saying, this is not you. This is not what you want to do. You're a fraud. Um, and it just got a little louder and a little louder. And, uh, then one day I sort of, uh, just, quit. I quit the the winemaking and the wine industry altogether. And I had some time off. And in that time off, I, I sat down and I thought, look, what am I going to do now? You know, what do I want to do that gets me out of bed each morning? And when I come home each day, I feel proud about myself. Hmm. And uh, I think it was, I had six weeks, I think it was, just sitting home with a pen <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and a book and just going through all these things and how I would spend the next sort of 10, 20, 30 years. And, um, and yeah, so that, that was it. And a lot of my friends thought I was crazy when I told them, hey, look, I've decided that I'm going to move into psychology. I was in my, now in my later 20s, I guess. And psychology is not an easy degree. It takes quite a long time. It's very competitive. It took me six years to get through the psychology degree, the psychology program in Australia. I was certain that that was, that was my path. I've never looked back, not for a second. Yeah. Uh, I still drink wine, but uh, <laughs> I no longer make it. We have parallel stories there as well. I, I left a, a very successful career in, in the television business and had been in it for 20 years. It was a sales director with all of the bells and whistles all of the perks you could possibly imagine and the salary and all of that. And very much like you, I realized one day that this wasn't for me. I'm so very grateful for the transition and for the transformation that happened. And I'm also grateful for the experience being in that business before uh, moving on on my own. But Mm -hmm. there is this pivot that we can take that we can either ignore or take. And when we ignore it, I think that brings on more suffering. I agree with that. And uh, my wife asked me just the other day, it's funny you say that. She said, um, do you ever regret leaving the wine industry? Because she met me when I was in the wine industry and she thought I was really cute. Mm -hmm. She she often says, you're a lot cuter as a winemaker. And, And the answer is, yeah, I do. But I often wonder what would have happened if I didn't make that pivot. You know, where would I be now? And it, and it kind of scares me. You know, and I, I feel I'd be quite sad and really missing out. It's a difficult pivot to make. It's yeah. uh, it's not easy, and it's certainly not easy for the first year or two. Oh my um, gosh, I completely <laughs> relate to that. I at one point thought, "What was I thinking? How completely arrogant of you to think that you could just start your own business and have everything replaced and have your lifestyle the way it was before." <laughs> <laughs> while you're you know setting up your entrepreneurial pathway and and even now of course I can laugh at that because it's 14 years later and I'm still here it was the hardest decision I'd ever made actually yeah and and I guess like some of that some of that initial uh, doubt 
uh, that you experience, Shan. Look, I, I, I feel that's because you haven't yet earned it. You know, like uh, as a winemaker, I, I, I worked hard for 10 years and I got up to that position of feeling confident in my abilities and, and, all, and all the rest of it. But um, when I stepped out into, in to, to be a psychologist and, you know, back as an undergraduate student, yeah, there, there's all, you forget about all those initial doubts and insecurities that you have when you're 19 or 20 in mm. embarking on a new career. Uh, you, you get to experience them all over again. Yeah. On your LinkedIn profile, you have a Carl Jung quote, the shoe that fits one person pinches the other. There is no recipe for living that suits all cases. Mm. I'd love for you to speak why you chose that. And tell us a little bit more. Yeah, look, I really love Carl Jung, and uh, I, I sat down one night to t- to type out uh, this really long LinkedIn introduction and bio. After about three or four hours, I looked back at it and I thought, "This is just not me. This is just not who I am. This is not really capturing what I'm about, what I feel, and what inspires me." This quote, I, I've never forgotten this quote. I, I came across the quote in my very early days studying psychology and it, and it always stuck with me. And I use it very much in my clinical practice with my clients. I just thought, you know, bugger it. Let's just get rid of all that, that, uh, that introduction and just delete that and just insert this quote. I feel that it's a really powerful quote because, and it's an important thing to remember as a psychologist as well, because when we're diagnosing people, when we're putting perhaps labels on people, which we probably shouldn't be doing, we're forgetting that people are different. People are coming in to the therapy room from all walks of life and they've had a lot of different experiences. And it just, re- it just reminds me, that, that quote reminds me and challenges me to think outside the box. Yeah, to this day, it's, it's just a, a hell of a quote something I very much put into my clinical practice. Incredibly powerful and a great way to reinforce that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to treatment. There just simply isn't. That's right. And uh, you you learn that within the first sort of half an hour of meeting a new client, um, when you're getting their, their history, when you're getting their background, when you're getting an understanding of where they're coming from, the precipitants that are causing their distress, and their lifestyle, you know, no, no, no one has the same life. We all live different lives. We all have different upbringings, different backgrounds. So it's, uh, you learn that pretty quick. And certain clients respond very well to certain types of therapy. Might be CBT, they'll, they'll, really, they'll learn really quickly with, with that uh, therapy. Others, they, they just like a different style. But no one likes to be pigeonholed, you know, people like to be treated as the unique, awesome individuals they are. And that also builds the trust. Yeah. So you're not, you know, sitting there just, okay, label, this is who you are, <laughs> this is what you need to do next. And un- unfortunately, those folks exist, but there are more of us than there are of them. As far as yeah. I'm yeah. And I think that's also a good time to share with our listeners if you're looking for a clinical psychologist and let's say you've made your first appointment and it didn't go very well or you something about the energy or something about the experience or you just didn't feel like you liked the person they weren't a good fit it's okay Mm. you don't have to go back and you can find someone else yeah you do not have to stay and and give uh any more of your time to somebody that you're not comfortable with. It's really important if you're going to take that leap and, mm. and get some help, you want to do it with somebody that you feel really good with. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I've, I've seen a fair few psychologists in my day and uh, I've had some shockers. <laughs> I've had some pretty bad ones. And uh, really uh, what, what people are looking for is just – that connection, that feeling of acceptance, you know, non judge yeah. compassion, empathy, someone who will listen and validate, you know, your experience. Um, and it shouldn't be too much to ask for. It really shouldn't. Um, not in a therapist that you're paying good money to go and see. So uh, first and foremost, prioritize those things when you go in and see someone. And as uh, Shan said, 
if you don't feel it, then try someone else. There's plenty of good therapists out there. You bad ones as well, but there's plenty of good. <laughs> you will find somebody that that fits well with you. It's just yeah. it's just sometimes it takes a little bit of time. After the break, we're going to dig deeper into Glenn's experience with anxiety and grief and all of the things that he's been able to do to support himself and thrive in his life. Today's Anxiety Slayer podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Are stress and anxiety interfering with your happiness and preventing you from living your best life? There have been several times in my life where I've needed extra support and wish I'd had the option for online support. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. To be clear, BetterHelp is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online, and their service is available for clients all over the world. You get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you don't have to leave the comfort of your own home. It's more affordable than traditional in-person counseling, and financial aid is available. We do have a special offer for Anxiety Slayer listeners. You can get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. That's betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. Glenn, before the break, I was just about to dig into your experience and I just was reading the question again. I was like, oh my goodness, to have your mother and father both pass while you were completing your degree had to be so tough. And I know that at that time that brought up quite a bit of anxiety and grief for you. And I'm just wondering how you cared for yourself during that period of time and how you, how you moved through it to, to get to where you are now. Mm, yeah. Uh, look, it was really difficult. I guess, you know, I'd, I'd embarked on this new career. Everything was positive. I was feeling great about myself. I was stepping out doing something I'd wanted to do, but hadn't done. So in a way, I was feeling quite free and liberated and all those wonderful things that someone would feel when they start something new and exciting. And uh, it was early into my first year of psychology, I got a phone call from my mum. She said that, look, dad's not well. You're going to have to come back and, and, and see him. And uh, I put it off, put it off for about three or four weeks, you know, I was busy. I was caught up in my own stuff and trying to get good grades and trying to establish myself. And, and mum had a way of, um, you know, I just was never quite sure if, if, you know, he really was sick or if he was just a little bit sick. I wasn't too sure. Right. But anyway, a few weeks went by and, um, I just, I just, one day I woke up and I thought, you've got to go and see your dad. Something is wrong. And I, I went down and I saw dad and he was, um, you know, he, I'd, it'd been a few months since I'd seen him last and uh, he was kind of laying in, in the bed and he looked like he'd lost uh, half of his body weight. Oh my and, goodness, uh, that's shocking. Yeah, it was. And, uh, and then he told me, look, I, we, we, I didn't want to bother you. I didn't want to upset you. I knew that you, you were doing very well at the moment in your life and, I'm proud of you. You're stepping out, doing what you love. Um, but I've got lung cancer and I'm sorry that I'm telling you so late. Uh, it, was a, it was a huge shock and unfortunately he did pass away a few months after that. Um, and, and I guess <laughs> it sort of took the wind out of my sails in a way, but um, there was, I, I, it, it also, it really made me quite tough. Wouldn't, wouldn't say resilient but uh, it made me quite tough. And uh, I started dedicating my studies to, to my father. And, um, you know, I, I, became, I became quite studious. And uh, as a result of that, uh, a little while later, about a year and a half later, well, maybe a little bit less than that, um, I got a phone call, another phone call from my sister who had been staying with my mom for a while. And um, same thing. Oh, Glenn, you've got to come and see mom. It's been a while. Um, she's not well. And uh, I'm thinking, okay, all right, what's going on here? Um, and I went and saw mom and, and she unfortunately had, had lung cancer as well. 
And uh, yeah, and she passed away a few months after that. Now, it was really, it really brought up a lot of unresolved guilt for me. And um, up until that point, up until I lost my mum, I'd had anxiety, but it was never, it was never severe, I guess you, you, you would say. It mm-hmm. was just always there in the background. I knew I had it. I knew it was a problem, but it wasn't too severe. I could still get by. I could still get out of bed. I could still go to parties, although sometimes I wouldn't enjoy the party or I'd be really anxious talking to people. I could still do it. Um, there was something about that experience and, and the grief that really amplified my anxiety. And uh, I got severe depression and severe social anxiety and generalized anxiety. The only thing that really got me going or got me through those, those years after mum died was just really putting all my thoughts, all my energy into my work. You know, I'd be studying upwards of 14, 15 hours a day. And uh, these are things that you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> these are things, you know, now, now I know what I know. You know, these are, these are all the wrong things to do. You know, you want to go and see a therapist and you want to work through that gr- grief. But I didn't do that. And it wasn't until uh, a few years later when I was doing my master's that I got in and saw a therapist again. And I was able to move through that. And very slowly, I've been, I've been able to recover from that. So it's been a long, a long journey and uh, it's been a tough one. Yeah. I'm so glad that you reached out and got support and that you didn't continue to, to uh, work and study so hard and distract yourself as much as possible and you know, all the things that we do to try to push things away sometimes. Mm. Yeah. And, and this is exactly what we do. And, um, it was, it was a lot of guilt. You know, I, I felt quite a lot of guilt in regards to my mother. I, I felt guilty that I wasn't there. She had schizophrenia and I guess I always distanced myself from her growing up. And um, in those last few months, I, I just felt tremendous guilt and shame that I wasn't there for her when she needed me. I could never understand, um, you know, it, it's, it's quite difficult for, if you're living with someone with schizophrenia. Um, I love my mum. I love my mum to this day. I miss her dearly. Um, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. But it, it really, in those last few months of her life, it, it just it brought up a lot of guilt and shame. And then that sort of uh, created this belief that maybe I'm not worthy, I'm not a good person, I'm not lovable. And that really fueled a lot of the anxiety and the depression. Yeah. As it does, because we... When we start to believe, or what I call when we fall into that shame pit, it's really Mm. hard to get out. And that is why there are people like you in the world (laughs) Mm. (laughs) to help, you know, to to throw the rope down and and help pull us up from whatever it is we're suffering from and and dealing with, and and really coming to know and understand that it's not your fault. And that that guilt is not something that you need to hold on to. And that to a degree, many of those feelings that are coming up are just feelings that are going to come up that need to be looked at and then released in any, you know, in any way that, that works for you through your therapy and, and the work on yourself. I'm I'm so glad that you're in a much better place. I, I can't imagine that happening all in such a short window of time. Well, so am I. It was it was not a good time. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's the thing. Um, you know, people have to remember. You know, time time just moves on. You know, and, and and things do improve. They do. Here we are getting close to the end of our conversation, and I've just got a couple more things that I'd like to cover. The first is how did you become interested in podcasting, and tell us a little bit about why you love. MindCog and what what it is you're doing there to support listeners so that some of our listeners can come over and, and check out your podcast. Podcasting was actually suggested to me by my therapist around not long after my mother died. And um, I needed something to do. I had a lot of negative thoughts coming in. And I, the therapist said to me, Glenn, you need to get some good in. 
need to get some good stuff into that brain. Yeah. You know, yeah. what are you listening to? What are you reading? What are you watching? And I told her, you know, Seinfeld, <laughs> science fiction uh, about the end of the world. And she's like, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> um, so so she, she suggested a whole heap of podcasts. And, uh, and, and so I started listening to podcasts. And um, one of the things I found very beneficial and therapeutic back then was going for a long walk and uh, listening to a podcast and, and, and positive podcasts as well, not just any podcast. And um, so I just fell in love with them that way. It was part of my, my therapy, part of my healing was to go for long walks by myself and just listen to podcasts. And I thought one day I'd like to do that. That seems like <laughs> a big And um, I put it off, put it off. I continued with my studies and, uh, and then after I'd finished my studies and I was out the other side, I thought now's, now's a good time. Yeah, now's a good time to to launch into this. And one of the things I'm I'm very passionate and excited about is self improvement and giving people the opportunity to make positive changes in their life. And not everyone has the the ability to go to do a psychology degree for six or eight years. Um, and I feel quite blessed having done so. You know, I, I'm not sure if I would be the person I am today. I'm not sure if I would have moved through all that pain without my training, without my experiences. So I thought, well, look, what's another way to share this uh, knowledge uh, with the world? I thought, well, podcasting is a great, great way of doing so. So I interview um, psychologists, I interview neuropsychologists, and, and all sorts of people that, that, can, that can help people make positive change in their life. Also, because I'm a psych geek, you know, I really <laughs> find, I find the whole thing really fascinating. And I'm sure there's other people out there who really... Uh, feel the same way. So the podcast, I do it. It's a labor of love. I, I don't take any money for the podcast at all in any way. I, I sometimes get embarrassed about my interviewing skills. I'm pretty bad. Um, I'm pretty pretty ordinary interviewer. But I feel that it's a, it's a great way for people to listen to people, listen to experts in their fields and you know, make positive changes in their lives. And it continues to fill your cup as well. Indeed, it indeed it does. Yeah. You say that you don't believe that therapists ought to be immune to mental illness. What do you mean by that? When I went to university, and particularly during master's degree, I, I, it wasn't really explicitly expressed, but it, it was this idea that this therapist had to be this perfect person, a person who in the therapy room doesn't disclose any information about themselves, doesn't open up and doesn't share their experiences, this is just not, not true. You know, a therapist can have problems with mental health. Therapists can have problems. We know, of course, we're, we're human beings, so if, of course we're going to have problems. I think back to a psychologist I saw, and this particular person was very open and honest about, about his experiences with mental health, and it just made me feel warm towards this person. I didn't feel in any way that it was deterring from you know, a therapeutic alliance or building that rapport. I felt connected to that person. And I feel psychologists a lot of the time get caught up in this idea that they can't disclose information about themselves. And of course, we don't want to tell people all about ourselves and, and, and whatnot. To, to just open up and say, you know, I, I've been there, you know, yeah. I've been. And the em empathy is worth its weight in gold. Yeah, it really is. And, and I do it with a lot of my clients and, and uh, they keep coming back. This needs to change in the, the mindset of psychologists. I agree. I'm so very grateful we had this conversation today, Glenn. You are so easy to talk with and your story is fascinating. Thank you for sharing your personal story here. I know that you haven't been doing this. This hasn't been your, your mode of operandi when you do interviews. So I'm glad we got to do the personal and help people get a better understanding of who you are, a little bit more about your journey and why you do the work that you do. You're welcome. That was Glenn Tanner. Learn more about Glenn and be sure to visit themindcogpodcast.com to listen into his podcast.